I thought I'd start, since this is CrossFit, talking about how I got involved in working out in the first place. This is the ad from when I was a child. Those of you who were my age know Charles Atlas was this 97-pound weakling <laughs> who got sand kicked in his face. And it really inspired him to start working out. And this is Charles Atlas <laughs> afterwards. And I think all of our guys should start wearing outfits like this here at CrossFit. <laughs> I just think what it would do for us. So, all right. <laughs> Scary. So the reason I got into it was because of bullying. And it wasn't bullying of me, it was my son. My son was in about eighth grade. My family has a characteristic of growing late, so he was very small for his age. He had a couple bullies stuff him in a garbage can at Reynolds Middle School. Really upsetting for him, and I wanted to help, help him with that. And it happened that I had a client that I was working with, Peter Freer, on a, for the company I was working with, and he did personal training. He did an odd combination of kickboxing, boxing, and submission grappling which is like UFC kind of stuff where you put someone in a position where you're going to dislocate their shoulder, they're going to tap out, just for self-defense. And I thought it would be good for my son Reed to do that, and I decided to go along with him, mainly because I wanted to look like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> or, or maybe, you know, <laughs> to, to be a little less, you know, ambitious than that, I just want to be able to wear a Halloween costume like this. <laughs> this is Rick, the coach, if you don't know it, at a Halloween party. You've never seen him like that. But actually, I, I didn't really get ever worry get, about getting beat up, but I used to have a recurring dream of being chased. I don't know if any of you have these negative recurring dreams. So I'd have this recurring dream where I was running away from something, which isn't really rational. Like, why do, you, why do you have a dream like that? So I worked out, and my son worked out with Peter for a period of months, learned how to kickbox and break somebody's kneecap, learned how to box, learned how to dislocate somebody's shoulder, that kind of thing. And one night I had that dream. The dream was very specific. I was somewhere dark, a car pulled up, two guys jumped out and started chasing me. This is a typical dream running away, and I ran into a bathroom on my dream and started trying to climb out the window, and, all, and they came in the bathroom, and all of a sudden it hit me. Wait a minute, I know what to do now. And I turned around in the dream, got in the defensive posture, and woke up, and I never had that dream again. Now, isn't that cool? <laughs> so it's, it's really, you know, is it risk or perception of risk? My perception of risk is like I don't have that same risk because I know how to defend myself now. So I'm going to talk about risk because I'm really interested in that subject. And what does risk bring up for you? Whoop. Is it something negative, like uncertainty? Is it gamble, worry? Do you be, are you the kind of person who, when you think of risk, you shrink back? Or are you more like me? When you take a risk, it's stimulating, rewarding. It makes life interesting, right? It's, it's just energizing. This is risk, but it's a really positive risk, right? So where does your feeling about risk come from? I think to, in order to have risk be positive, you have to have trust. You have to have an optimism, a positive feeling that taking the risk is worth, worth taking it. You have acceptance if things don't work out, you hope they're going to work out. This is opportunity. You know, with risk comes reward, right? So where do we learn the lesson of risk and trust? You know, how do we balance out your fear and risk with the trust and the reward? What well, comes from our parents? <laughs> now this this father isn't trying to terrorize his child, right? He's not, you know, like, oh, I'm gonna, you're, you're going to die. It's no, I'm going to catch you. Your parents, you know, of course they teach you about risks. You know, don't run with scissors. I know for a fact that if I go swimming within 30 minutes of eating, I'm going to drown. I'm going to get a stomach cramp and drown. You know, they teach you about those kind of risks, but they also teach you who to trust. You know, trust your parents and your, your teachers, authority figures. 
So there's always that balance. You want to give your children leeway and you want to tell them to, to watch out, but, but it's a balancing act. This is the first thing I did. See, my parents did a good job of letting me accept risk. My first hobby when I got out of the house was skydiving. This is me a few years ago, <laughs> quite a few years ago with my army surplus parachute. I ended up running a parachute school outside of Houston. Really enjoyed it. In fact, skydiving is the most exhilarating thing. I mean, just flying around with people and it doesn't take much just move your fingers and you can fly around. It, it is absolutely exhilarating. There's a dirty secret I'm going to tell you about skydiving, though. It's really pretty safe. <laughs> it's something that seems dangerous, but here's the statistics. The last year they had it, there were 3 million jumps with 19 deaths. That's 0.63 fatalities per 100,000 jumps. And I thought, well, let's find something that's kind of comparable in terms of fatality rates. And I found one, a 10-year study of tennis players in Germany. <laughs> Over that time, there were 1.7 million players, 15 deaths. That's 0.86 fatalities per 100,000 players. And as it happens, a couple of years ago, my father, playing tennis, went for an overhead smash and fell over backwards on his head and ended up in the hospital for more than a week. I've been trying to convince him to take up skydiving to stay safe, <laughs> but so far it hasn't worked. So there's something about doing something that appears dangerous but isn't that I find appealing.